Great. Yeah. Yeah. Woo Great. Um, so, I'm Doug, uh, and I give this talk at Elasticon, as you can tell. Welcome to Elasticon, by the way. You didn't know you were in San Francisco. Um, and the talk is called Ghost in the Search Machine. Uh, I think before I get started, I'm going to just tell you a little bit about myself, the company that I represent. Um, I am Doug Turnbull. I just finished this book for the last uh, in June or something. It's felt like it's taken forever. Uh, and one of the things, I work at a company called Open Source Connections. We're a solar and elastic search consulting shop. We've been doing it for quite a while now. So pretty focused on helping people solve all kinds of thorny problems with solar and elastic search. Um, with us is one of our partners, uh, Flax, which is also a, a great consulting shop uh, over in, uh, in London. So they're here visiting today, uh, Charlie and Alan, uh, if you um, also would like to talk to them. Uh, and one of the thorny problems that we're really passionate about, both us and Flax, is this problem of search relevance. And it's something that we see our clients get, get stunned by quite a lot. And if you've ever used Maybe an e-commerce site that wasn't Amazon can't find what you're looking for with search. How many people have had that experience, right? You're just mad at the site search. Right? <laughs> that is really what search relevance is all about. It's about trying to improve how we're matching people, shoppers, maybe people searching research, maybe scientists, or maybe scientists searching research, or maybe people searching their intranet, or people searching for travel improve our ability to match them to things that they need. Um, and one of my, my personal big beliefs is if you look at a lot of what, a lot of the machine learning that's going on these days is really, a lot of it is really focused on that, matching people to stuff that they need. Hey, come on in. How's it going? Um, <clears throat> whether it's I got in the car from the grocery store and my phone is telling me the directions I need to get home, Google Now, all of these things are really in this realm of what I generally think of as relevance-driven applications. And what I want to show you tonight is how Elasticsearch can really be a key part of that uh, of that movement, especially for the people who aren't Google. <coughs> Hopefully that comes back. Okay. Especially the people who aren't Google uh, or Amazon and really just need to build something smart uh, and good enough for their purposes. That, reasonable cost. And I really think open source search technologies like Elasticsearch are really going to play a huge role there. Um, aside, aside from all those plugs I just gave, one thing you guys may be interested in, and I say this uh, because I plugged the conference to the meetup, I also will just, or I plugged this meetup to the conference goers, the solar uh, conference. Uh, tomorrow and Friday, there's a really good conference, uh, we've seen Solar Revolution, focus probably more on low-level details than like you get at Elasticon. So if you really like want to get into the a lot of the underlying stuff that goes on, uh, I definitely recommend it. It's a great conference. It tends to be a little bit more focused on data science-y information retrieval kinds of problems. So check it out. Um, is anyone here going to the conference tomorrow? Okay. Interesting. Okay. So if you want to take two days off, uh, otherwise no worries. Uh, so and yes, I, as I said, I brought I have a book, and I have four copies here that I will give out and sign to the people that ask that ask me the best questions and hopefully ones I cannot answer. Make me look like a complete fool, which is really my goal in doing it. Um, I do not have all the answers. Only a subset of them. Uh, so, discount code REL search. If you don't happen to win a copy, definitely grab that discount code. Um, if we had a whiteboard, I would write it down, but REL search, uh, check that out. And this book is really about a lot of what I'm talking about tonight is about what's in this book. And um, what I'm going to talk about, kind of step back a little bit. Most people, I feel like a lot of people know how a search engine works, but I really want to sort of redefine in my view sort of what a search engine brings to the table and why it's so important for, for relevance and these relevance applications we're going to be solving for the next decade. 
And it's important to step back and ask yourself, why do we have a search engine? Like, what does a search engine do that database doesn't? Why don't we use MySQL, Mongo, Cassandra, and those sorts of things? Like, why are we all here today, basically? Like, what brought you here? Um, besides the opportunity to win an amazing book. Um, and this is a, this, these slides I'm gonna go through, I'm gonna do some slides and then give some demos that are gonna show maybe some more interesting aspects of doing just text search that we're used to. These slides are often, I use them also in a lot of introduction, like Google Python meetup or something, and tell people how a search engine works. So uh, if you follow, if you're very familiar with this, uh, I won't, I'll try to get through this pretty quickly, but I won't blame you if you nod off for five minutes. So, we have, let's pretend we have MySQL. We've thrown this text into MySQL. And this is my favorite Reddit data set, Science Fiction Stack Exchange, right? How many people have used Science Fiction Stack Exchange to ask nerdy questions about some, like, Stranger Things or something? <laughs> or Star Wars? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> yeah. I was, so I, I wondered what in that show, if there's an alternate universe, why are there houses in the alternate universe? Were there people that lived there, and then they, and then they, uh, then somehow they got eaten by the monster or something? I don't know. Anyway, so uh, so if we're trying to find Darth Vader, and this, I swear this works every time I edit it, if I move the circle, and I think that's an aspect ratio thing. Uh, so not a great search no. engine already because my sequel doesn't quite circle the right area. <laughs> It's missing here, and again, uh, so how many people have solved a search problem or implemented a search interface using SQL-like? So back in, the, I think it's, uh, there's still PHP BB sites out there. PHP BB famously limits only logging users to 30 seconds, or one search every 30 seconds, precisely because SQL-like is terrible, performs a table scan with a wildcard search, and it's just a terrible way to search anything, right? And I think when I was doing this on some laptop, it took 300 milliseconds to search 20,000 science fiction Jack Exchange articles. Which, if you're most forums, I guess have about 20,000 posts, so. Then we know why this stinks, right? It's extremely slow, like I just said. It's not fuzzy. You can do it might lowercase for you, but if there's, you need basically an exact rule <coughs> match to your string. And this is, you know, why we also don't use control F and grep to implement search applications. We need an exact literal match for your string. There's no notion of fuzzy matching or anything specific to your language, like going getting down to root forms or anything like that of words. And probably more importantly, it's completely unranked. You just get like stuff that matches. You don't know which part is more relevant than not relevant. And we want things ranked by relevance. We want the right answer to come to the top. So, how many people, you know, how many people are new to Elasticsearch? Like, maybe got into it in the last couple months or, okay. So you've probably done this. This is the training, right? You can create an index, and you don't even have to do this one first line. You can just start throwing data at it, which is the great thing about Elasticsearch. It's really easy to get started. Uh, and I'm gonna play with this little string here. And if we think about it, what is Elasticsearch building for us? Elasticsearch, instead of having this, you can think about, uh, you can think about SQL-like as searching for things this way, right? Where is the part about humming, searching humming, and then in the back you'd be like, oh, there it is, there's an index, right? And that's what a search engine gives you. Much more efficient way to look things up than scanning everything. And, you know, book index, we have topics, Shakespeare, pages. Lucene also uses an index, great. And this is really the core data structure of Lucene. Tokens to document IDs. Laser is in documents two and four. Light, documents two and five. Lightsaber is in documents zero, one, five, and seven. If I wanna find all the document, if I search for light, all that Lucene has to do is look up this data structure and give me this list back. Maybe if I, it's nice, it might look up the field so it can display that. But basically, that's all you have to do. Um, make sense so far? Okay. Unfortunately, even with, this, even with this data structure, computers are dumb. 
we're smart, right? At least until the AI overlords destroy us in 20 or 30 years or whatever. Right now, we're smart. Uh, we can tell that cat and cats are the same idea. We can tell that kitty and cat is the same idea. We can tell that uh, we could tell that you know feline is the same idea. Kitten is very closely related. So we have all these like we have a network of word associations in our brain basically. So we can use an index to be like, oh well, I can't find cat, but I can go to the K and find kitty, and I find what I want. Computers are really dumb, and this is probably the hardest part of doing actual re meaningful good search work, search relevance work especially. Capital cat is not the same as lowercase cat just in the context of this data structure that we looked at. All of these are distinct UTF-8 strings to the inverted index data structures <coughs> underneath search, right? So computers are just gonna be stupid when they're used as index. And this is why when we step a layer out from the index, there's a whole extra process that search engines go through called analysis. And analysis basically takes a string, and this is the string we threw at, uh, we threw at uh, Elasticsearch to create the document, and decomposes it into tokens. You can tell, ask Elasticsearch to do this directly. And it's interesting when you look at it. First thing you notice is that we gave Elasticsearch five words, and there's only four entries in here. With was taken out. <coughs> to this snowball analyzer, which is something that has some knowledge of how English works, with is a, known to be a meaningless word, right? It's a stop word. Uh, of course, things are lowercase, so things kind of are just normalized down to a lowercase. Dine is normalized down to a root form, dine, which can help us look up many different forms of, of search with many different forms of that word and get the same kinds of results back. Uh, and we get all this metadata too as well that's helpful. So we build, and you can actually tell, you can tell Lucene to do this, some older versions of Elasticsearch to do this. This is basically something called a simple text codec that uh, Mike McCandless, who's a Elastic guy, I think Lucene, uh, very well known Lucene committer, uh, has implemented. You can actually tell Lucene to, hey, store things this way. It's slow as molasses, but you can open your index files in a text editor and see how it's stored. Basically, that index is right here. We've got a field, index is per field. We've got terms, Darth has occurs in documents one and two. And luckily, how do we, so how are we gonna deal with this ranking problem, right? Well, we have all this metadata that we can put about each term's occurrence in each document. Can we store something here? Yeah, we can store all kinds of things about about the occurrence of this term in the document. For the purposes of relevance, the term frequency is really important. So how many people know what TFID is? Or, so few people. So term frequency, if, uh, if dog, you know, how many times does this word occur in this text is one factor that you have to take into account. Um, and then there are various global and document specific statistics to take into account. So this term frequency, how much, or in this case, how much does Darth occur in doc one? Maybe it occurs two times. There's also document frequency, which lets us know how special Darth is as a term. If Darth occurs in thousands of documents, it's a lot less relevant, it's gonna get a lower relevancy score than if Darth occurs in just two documents. And that matters when you're searching with multiple terms, Darth, Vader, Luke. So that's where TF-IDF scoring comes from. It's a very basic way of doing similarity between a query and uh, occurrence of this term in a document. Make sense so far? Remember, questions get books. <laughs> um, so, taking this all back, when did Darth, Vader, and Luke have dinner? Here's our search query, right? Luke, Darth, dinner. Here's our text. What's gonna happen to it? Well, as you might have guessed, before we can use this to consult this index constructed from analyzed tokens, 
we have to run it through, we also have to run it through analysis and get tokens out, which is done for us. We, we could have told Elasticsearch to use a specific analyzer. We could have done a lot of things, but it's, there's a rules for what the default analyzer is. So it pulls out these tokens. We line them up to the index, pull out the documents that match, score each one, and which results are return sorted back to the client. Oh, before I'm an idiot. So that's basically, in 20 minutes, a lot of the stuff, that's 90% of what a typical search engine does. And those, of course, search engines are somewhat like chess. Pretty easy to, to understand what's happening. Now, very complicated and some, often very challenging to actually master and get something that's, that's going to uh, deliver amazing relevant results for every query and understand all kinds of ambiguities of the world of English language or world of whatever language. So, any questions before I dive into demos or? Yeah. So, is when you talk about that we can store metadata, is metadata always static? Or can metadata be generated, like dynamic? Like gen generated? Like dynamic. So for example, let's say on Google search, I have options for moderate filters and for setting other options. Yeah. So then the metadata, metadata could change for the those options. Or you wanted to give a person. So if I wanted to filter, let's say I did the search, but I also wanted to include a date range. Is that what you're yeah. yeah, so that would also become part of there's a way that Elasticsearch maps a date to this data structure. But yeah, that would become, there's part you could use a filter. Filters are just queries that are not scored. To apply a date filter to say, I want to only include this range. And then within that, I want to score using this query. So yeah, you could totally do that. There's a very rich query DSL for specifying all kinds of constraints on the data you want, and modifying either a filtering stage, which I think of filtering is happening before any relevance comes into the picture, just get those old documents out of there, and then also controlling the relevance ranking. So what, the, what query is it, what should be, what would be ideal, you know, what could be the ideal document for this query, and then things are sort of relevance ranked based on that. So metadata is always related to document and therefore it is always static. Do you mean, so there's the, if you're thinking of like a publication date, or are you thinking of things that change about the document? Like for example in the metadata you also have, like when you go to the next slide. Oh, that metadata. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, this metadata is very s specific to search. So. There is something called payloads, which is a arbitrary data, binary data you can attach, but it's a pretty uh, low-level concern, fairly complicated. Um, for what you're talking about, you wouldn't necessarily put a date here. You might have a separate field that's a date field that you would let you filter. So one of the things that's really interesting about how this works is we talk about this a lot in, in the book. These terms, Darth Vader Dine, that, that we're extracting from language through this analysis process really represent sort of the most important features or properties of this text based on an understanding of how English works. So what a lot of what you do in relevance work is try to manage this process so that you're very finely controlling what's going to match and what's not going to match. So for example, uh, let's say for some reason we're searching tweets. Tweets might, we might think of tweets a little bit differently than we might think of a uh, book, for example. Tweets, we have to honor hashtags and those kind of things. Hashtags have to make it into the index. Do we care about stemming as aggressively? Maybe we just care about 
people are going to have much less space to write with. Maybe we don't care about stemming as aggressively. Maybe we just want to maybe take off plurals, and maybe we get dined in dinner. Maybe they should be two separate terms. These are often sort of the artistic kind of things you think about when you're developing uh, a traditional search application, depending on what people's expectations are. And one thing that's really interesting to me with this data structure is when you think about how what these terms are, they're really sort of some feature that happens to occur in these entities, document one, document two, then these features don't necessarily have to have anything to do with language. Um, we give an example in our book of viewing uh, Parsons code, which is a way of, uh, everyone heard of Shazam, you hum, hum a song and it searches for the song. There's a way to encode that into an index, sort of based on pitch changes into the search terms, and then also generate a query from how people are humming into the same sort of space of, of tokens, um, and use the same kind of techniques. Um, and I know that sounds really esoteric right now, but I have a demo that I think helps get that idea across about how relevance work tends to, how you can use Elasticsearch to do lots of interesting stuff. Everyone see okay, let me zoom. Maximize. So we really believe that you can tokenize anything, and Lucene over the years has really proven that true. People are using it for all kinds of things to look to do search, DNA, locations. And one of the things that I'm going to demonstrate here is this idea of tokenizing images to do a reverse image search. So reverse image search, I give the search engine an image, and it finds images that are similar to that image. Um, how would we do that? How would we use, it's basically a data modeling exercise. How do we generate tokens that really support that uh, operation? Well, one way, and this is the, a naive way for entirely educational purposes, don't go and tell your boss you need to do this in production because Elasticsearch will fall over at scale. But one way to do this and just kind of help get our minds working is to generate tokens based on the position. It's with this index value. Is everything you care about this code is in these two lines. Is this generate these tokens? This is a position, and then these are RGB values. And all I'm going to do is index into this images index type image a field with bitmap and every this is 100 by 100 basically 10,000 tokens for each image so if the top left corner is black that would mean this would be a zero for the zeroth position so Two five five two five two five five, five. except to increase the chances that things will match. I'm doing this division, integer division by ten, so that very close shades of red and green and whatnot will match. So I can index this, and then once this is indexed and I have all this in my index, I can take an image, repeat this process on it, and issue the tokens that are generated out of that as a search query. As a giant massive search query that makes you, how many people know what max boolean clauses is? Yeah, it's probably the first thing that popped into Alan's head, <laughs> max boolean clauses. So you have to tweak that uh, a little bit. There's a setting that says how many simultaneous search terms you can search with, uh, but it's not a big deal to increase it, at least for this demo. So if I, let me get back to my search application. So, so we saw how the, any questions so far about how the data is generated into the search index? Okay. Basically, here's, uh, we're gonna 
pass the search function, the URL to an image. We do a lot of gobbledygook so that it can be treated as a file. Uh, and we pass that image to the same function that we I showed you before. And it just creates a giant uh, search spaces in between. Runs this elastic search query with all of these uh, image tokens, <coughs> image words, whatever you want to call it. Runs them and then iterates over the hits and displays using IPython report function the image that was uh, searched for. So if I run this, it indexes a bunch of images. <coughs> it's kind of neat because it works, actually works reasonably well. If I'm searching for this red truck that's oriented this way, I get a red car that's sort of oriented the same way and they both have kind of a chrominess to them, right? Uh, and then the next thing that pops out is a red truck, and so on and so forth. These things definitely seem increasingly dissimilar. Uh, I'm also cheating by only putting six images in my index. <laughs> but this is a meetup, luckily, that's why this is a meetup demo, and not a, a pitch to a client. Um, so, and what's interesting about this isn't the fact that this is a, a something you would push to production or like I've revolutionized image search because that's not at all what I've done. What's interesting about this is to think about, to get away from the idea of text-based relevance and focus on image-based relevance. What could we add to our search index to make this a lot smarter? Neural networks. <laughs> <laughs> what would neural networks do? Uh, natural language processing. You're asking me? Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, I've seen some image search that's really, really good. Yeah. They utilize neural networks because you get um, weighting factors and you get like um, a feature. You get like a feature model, right? Yeah. So instead if, of it being pixel to pixel, it'd be like a whole map that goes through a series, of almost like a little brain that can sort of relate things and have an idea of what a cat looks like, kind of. Yeah. Sure. So what a bird, what a bird. What a convolutional neural network would do is maybe find the features in an image that probably matter most. So it might find this curve here or this uh, pointy ear thing here. Um, and what's interesting is if we can, with neural networks, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, if you slice it in half, you get an encoder, right? So you have out of that like a bunch of features, roughly, and weights output of neuron one through five or whatever in different weights. We could tell Elasticsearch about the output of that encoder and add that to this index in the same way that we've at just told it done the dumb thing and not told it about pixels. In fact, you know, maybe that's probably a more efficient way to do it because we're probably decomposing the, the feature space quite a bit instead of showing it, talking about every pixel. So yeah, that's definitely one thing we could, we could possibly do. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Normalization to control for perspective. Oh, that's a good idea. So you, you could somehow figure out, I think neural networks, there are neural network stuff that can do that, but somehow figure out like the orientation. Um, so let's pretend we had that box and I wonder if we had a magic box that could tell us orientation. And that would be interesting because I wonder if we could do you, so this is this gets back to another interesting question. What what do we actually care about in this application, right? So I could see that being we want to find things that are similar orientation. Is that your idea? Like we want to find things or we want to normalize things to put them in a similar orientation. So we could go either direction. We could use one to sort of maybe adjust the picture or where the pixels line up, maybe through some graphics class I saw through in college or something. Um, and, or we could say we want to find things of a similar orientation and we're like, this car is pointing, I don't know, north, northeast or something. Or this car is pointing east. Exactly. So you can, you can maybe, there are places where you throw images at like Mechanical Turk or something and they're like, car, red, and throw that as a field. And what, I, what, what you're seeing is all of these different factors, they could all be different fields that you're applying to this relevance problem of image search. 
And what Elasticsearch is really giving you is this amazing platform to, to take in account all of these different uh, parameters, balance them against each other. Um, maybe, in, ad in addition to metadata, maybe you have some taxonomy about cars. So maybe we know that this is a fire truck, which is a utility vehicle, which is a kind of this. This is a car, a sports car, which is a kind of fun car. And down below is a convertible, which is a kind of sports car, which is a kind of fun car. Uh, there's a whole field of managing taxonomies. In fact, Charlie's going to go speak at a taxonomy conference about search technology next, next week. Uh, and sort of there's a, ways you can do similarities between taxonomies. So let's say we search for a, a truck and we don't have any trucks. Maybe we can show them an ambulance because it's pr very closely related to a truck uh, in that taxonomy. It's maybe one node off. And there's ways that I won't get into right now about managing those taxonomies. So, any other questions, criticisms? So, this is kind of content, right? Yeah. You're adding content to the search portion. It's a con context? Yeah, adding context, context yeah. So it's, you know, uh, Charlie's company has a great blog article on why they consider boosts harmful. Um, and I was talking to someone last week at the Atlanta Elastic Meetup, and they were saying, are you, are you telling me if I put more data about my, put more meaningful data about my content into my search engine, it will help me with relevance? Do you recommend that as opposed to, you know, tweaking boost over the existing fields, and definitely recommend you find something that is meaningful to your users when you're searching. Incorporate that as opposed to trying to just work over like your title or body field and play with boosts and that sort of thing. Any other questions? Yeah. Can you ever use, uh, I don't know if anybody's done, I'm sure somebody's done this, but I don't know, uh, use an image as a as a query, um, not in this way, but in the way of like, um, this is uh, an abstract image that represents my uh, desires for what I'm looking for, and based on my user profile, for instance. Uh, so you can incorporate stuff about people in a query, definitely. That's so what you mean. Like maybe it's like a four by four image, you know, like a Myers Briggs or something. Oh yeah, and then have like intensity for each of the Myers Briggs boxes, sure. And then it would be like maybe uh, white for not on, gray for kind of in that area, and then black for definitely, and then use that those bits essentially to decompose the image, and then use it <coughs> to map them to uh, other users' profiles or something. You to like find users like you. Or or not like you or whatever, yeah. Or like build a dating site right. or something, right? Um, so yeah, um, so what I would probably, there's a couple ways you could do that. If I cared about, um, if I cared about, what are the Myers-Briggs groups? Like INTP, okay. INJP, those could be, each of those could just be individual terms in some personality field too. You could just search over those. And if we cared about like gradations of that, uh, there's a couple ways we can play with it with gradations of that. One way that's a little hacky, but actually kind of works if you don't actually store the data, is to just mention a term twice. Because in the inverted index structure, it's just incrementing a counter. Um, so you could say, you are extra judgy, better said. What is the J and INJ? Judging, yeah, that's right. You're, you're extra judgmental. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was intrigued by your talking about capturing hierarchical taxonomies, but get control vocabularies. Yeah. Uh, are you going to talk about that later, or? Uh, I can. Is there a whiteboard that is would have to be easily accessible by any chance? I can also just look at a text editor. <laughs> Backup whiteboard. So one uh, and. One great strategy, there's something in Elasticsearch, uh, we've seen actually, that's called the hierarchical, hierarchical path tokenizer. And what that lets you do is break up, 
Uh, is that exposed in Elasticsearch without yeah. getting into the guts? Or? It is, yeah. It's, uh, and we have examples. Since you asked the question, you're getting a copy of the book. And you can <laughs> but, but if you had, let's say, animal, animal. You got it on your font. Oh, thanks. Animal Kingdom. Uh, where is the... Alright. Why does it zoom just work? There we go. We have animal, feline, cat. Animal, feline, dog. Animal, canine. Wait, that doesn't make sense. Tiger. Dog. Made this taxonomy for all the things. Animal, uh, thing, robot, robot, no. thing. Uh, what's the other good thing? Uh, what's the other kind of thing? Uh, what's that? Jack. Yeah, thing, sitting <laughs> device. <laughs> So, one thing, one thing that you can do, uh, a great strategy is actually, uh, we decompose these using the path tokenizer to do something like this. Path tokenizer says generate, here's the delimiter, and the delimiter here is slash, and we can ge generate terms from this. Generate, and I'm using this character to mean it's the token animal from this animal feline animal feline cat um, and then let's say we had this for tiger as well so these are the tokens that are going, going to go in the index <coughs> here's our tiger document Our cat document. Now let's say we came along and searched for um, a panther. <coughs> so here's our search query, panther. Panther is in a synonyms file. Perhaps it's mapped to our synonyms. Are you familiar with the synonym filter in Elasticsearch? So Elasticsearch lets you map basically tokens to other tokens. And say this is a wow, we've identified the search term as part of our taxonomy panther, animal feline panther. And then we're going to repeat this process. So we're going to generate these tokens. And what's going to happen is we don't have a panther in our index. We are going to search for animal. This is what like a match query would do. It's going to search on the tokens that are generated. Animal feline. Or that. Now we don't have a panther in our index, so this is just not going to match anything. We do have animals. We have these two. Animals and felines. And I was talking earlier about uh, TFIDF. So of these two search terms, one is more rare than the other. Animal is very common. So things that match this are not gonna get scored very highly. Feline is more specific. It's gonna get scored more highly. And so what you're gonna get as search results is basically, uh, you know, tiger and cat. equal relevance score. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does, thank you. Okay. Any other any other stuff that jumps? Well I, if you want if you want a good one, how about hyperlog log? <laughs> oh man. <laughs> uh, unique key, I have sixteen million documents in 
there, but hyperlog log is 10 counts that would only show me like 1,500. Really? Yeah. You have 16 million unique terms? Unique documents, uh, unique, okay. unique key, and uh, on that key, I only got 1,500, 2,000 count. Distinct you know the answer, Alan? Yeah, that was 1.7.5. That's like an adversary case for hyperlog logo. Pardon? You've got an adversary case for hyperlog logo. Uh, apparently, yeah. That's, yeah, it, it will. Uh, so, it's, so it'll estimate things, but it's, it's, it'll estimate things on, you know, based on uh, uh, how, how big your. How big the filter is, the bit set filter, and yeah, you know, 40,000 or 20,000, somewhere around there. Okay, but if you, everything is unique, everything is unique, then it's probably just going to fill up the whole thing. Yeah. And so it's going to say, well, okay, well, I'm going to guess that. Yeah, I can't remember what the mapping function back in back to natural number is. So, just some background in Elasticsearch, uh, Hyperlog Log is estimating distinct counts, is what's used. And this was a really weird edge case that. It's way off. It should be about 5% off, maybe. Yeah. 10%. And this was nowhere even in the ballpark. You have many orders of magnitude difference between the huge orders. <laughs> mm -hmm. huh. Six orders. Interesting. Igor, does that ring a bell or is that a bug? That's yeah, I think, I think he explained it pretty well. So basically, yeah. you've got a certain set and you fill it completely, and what you got back is a completely different set. So, distinct count only works for. Things where you're going to have a distinct count less than the number of bits that you have in your hyperlog log estimator. Yeah, I guess. So. I didn't think that was true. It it should, should, yeah, weird. because it should be using the. It should know the number of distinct. Why well, it should know the total number of documents there? I would think it would estimate on the subset that is sampling the number of uniques and then essentially scale them up to the number. Well, if you want to chat with if you, me, you that, were, that was a stumper out. for if you wanted something really. Did you raise? Well. Did you raise? You this you we already got a book. Did you raise? Did you two books? <laughs> uh, not yet. I, I still was trying to make sure it wasn't something stupid. I had done. Okay. But I haven't figured out anything that I could have screwed up. Yeah, I, I can spin it up if I can get on Wi Fi. Cool. Cool. I have a question. So, that, um, the examples you demonstrated kind of the English language and the chunk of it, but how, uh, how would it work with kind of subsets of the letters within a word? So, for example, like to use um, chemical strings, right? something and it's made up of multiple things, how would you just, would you be able to search with it kind of to say, well, it's part of this big molecule, but I'm looking for only these four letters in it. So there's, chemical structures are, are, are pretty, pretty specific, unique challenges, they're, yeah. they're crafts. Um, I know, actually, Flax has done work, but the European bioinformatics is too. Yeah. Um, well, it was, well, it's, yeah, we didn't really work with that thing. There's the, uh, the NIH over here that does similar things. Uh, that's with the protein structures yep. rather than the chemical structures. So the nice thing about protein structures is it, it's, uh, exactly. it, it, it's linear. Uh, and yeah, the way they do things, they chop it up into. Uh, they like engram it into. Yeah, essentially. But you, you chop it up into like sort of five or ten uh, proteins and index those. Uh, and then they, they have a really, a nice, a really nice thing where they can use, um, you can look at the frequency, the substitution frequencies. So you can say, okay, well, if you've got this protein, it's most often substituted for these proteins. There are some proteins that yeah. you always never get as substitutions because of the structures are completely different. But, know, but, yeah, yeah but, but some of them are like, okay, well, there's three or four proteins here, but actually they're quite often substituted and it doesn't actually make a, a, uh, a difference to the phenotype. Um, and so you can you can map that out. You can have a matrix to say, okay, given this five by five, uh, so given, given this five, uh, this, this five protein string, five what, 
uh, where it's, oh, it's, 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 it's protein. Yeah, yeah, so five amino acids. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, no, it won't be a, it's not an amino acid. Okay. But it's to say, okay, given that, what are the, the likely differences? And then you actually, you actually write a similarity on that. So you, you search for this um, this string, yeah. but also say, okay, well, and then these are the strings here, and you're going to uh, rank it based on how far they are away from these comparative strings as well. Oh, okay. So you essentially end up doing you end up doing basically a matching on a match on every single protein in there. So is it kind of but, but you rank it based on the similar. Similar idea. Well, that one was it's, it's actually it's searching for okay, which terms do we yeah. have in common? This one isn't searching for terms in common. It's searching searching for terms that are similar. So it's saying okay, I, I'm, I'm taking. I'm going to give you a result. Yeah. The, the, your result set is everything, everything else in the, in the index, mm -hmm. but it's ranked based on the similarity. So you're, okay. you're doing, using the similarity to go and compare every other protein against this particular string that you put in there, mm -hmm. and say how similar it is, mm -hmm. based on based yeah. on these the, the, the frequency the substitution frequencies. Are you using engrams for that? Uh, it's it's not engrams. It's not like a sliding window engram. It's just, yeah, you chop it up. So it's like five. It's not me, but, but, but if you're not. Using engrams or doing overlapping window, um, cutting it up into overlapping windows, then you're, it's not really necessarily going to match because it's you're not starting. you're not actually you're not matching. So it, it's not it doesn't match. It doesn't say okay, I'm only returning the proteins that also have these things here. Yeah. It returns every single other protein that you have, but it scores them, and it uses it uses the similarity to score things instead of doing a match. So like based on it's like the matrix showing shared properties of the yeah. So like this is zero zero is a specific kind of amino acid that happens to show up, and then zero <laughs> one is a different kind of amino acid. Yeah, exactly. And are they related? Like are they adjacent ones related to each other in any way, or are they just independent it, like kinds of kinds of? Uh, it's it's the okay. Give, given this string, this string next to it, okay, it, it has the following set of substitutions in it. What is the what is the the, uh, the likelihood of these substitutions, given that we already know that these substitutions are more likely than other ones. Okay. Uh, and because generally the protein databases are quite small, you only got 3,000 proteins and stuff like that, you can say, okay, well, okay, this is going to give only some uh, it's, it's not, here's a list of every single yeah. protein in the world, which ones are similar. It's okay, here are the proteins in 20,000 different species. Let's, can you rank them by similarity um, to give you an idea of what the, the evolutionary tree looks like? So it's kind of a, yeah, it's, it's a different, a different problem. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, and also that wouldn't scale to okay, every single protein has ever been sequenced for yeah. anything. Which would be to, to, but that that wouldn't be an efficient way of searching against them. Yeah. There's an there's a associated thing where they do um, uh, protein shapes because the way proteins fit together impacts how biology works. You know, does an enzyme have a thing that fits into it? Yeah. And size how. <coughs> so you can um, take the three D structure of a protein use uh, various techniques, one, one you can use is called the 3D spherical harmonics, and create terms about yeah. the shape, and then put those in the index. Mm. Yeah, so that, that's that's closer to like, yeah. the image. Yeah. So it, it, it comes to yeah. Doug's point, it, it, you can put any, the tokens can represent anything, yeah. just the quality of the thing, but it's, if you figure out cunning ways to generate those tokens from your source data, be it an image, be it a 3D shape, be it a, a book, um, that, that's how you can use the power of an index to, to do this kind of clever searching. Okay. We, we, did, we did something like that uh, years ago for a furniture, uh, for interior design company, yeah, like 3D yeah. models of yeah. sofas. So you'd say, give me something that a long, low couch yeah. that was shaped a bit like this one without using any of those words. Just, here's a 3D model of the thing I like. Give me things that are shaped like this mm -hmm. by other manufacturers. Yeah. Engine. It's interesting because like search engines are, there's all this great stuff that's being done, you know, in all kinds of stuff. <laughs> Spark over here, all this stuff over here, and search engines are a great place to host this for sort of the ad hoc querying when the user asks a question. Uh, we've described into search engine now, let me ask a question and get stuff ranked back on relevance. So, so. Well, IBM Watson is basically like a search. Yeah, yeah it's, 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 it's like an expected system. It is. IBM's also 
taken all their existing products and just called them Watson too. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I noticed that as well. <laughs> so I'm not sure how much Wat where Watson actually is. In the there. original Q and A Watson system yeah, was basically yeah. a search engine. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, it's a search engine. It's an it's a question answering system. Yeah, which is a slightly different thing. But but yeah, if you they won't they, they won't tell you anymore. But all the presentations used to tell you lots of lovely technical detail. Yeah. Um, and now they just talk about how magic it all is. Yep. <laughs> it was like we could sell a third Lucene, a third a rules engine, yeah. a third a classifier or something. And hundreds of out IBM engineers cheating it to death. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Probably an RDF store as well in there. Because uh, one sure of the that things that <laughs> it said at the beginning with, with the word with uh -huh. is meaningless, but it's not semantically meaningless. It's just, yeah. it is a stop word for basic search, but if you wanted to actually draw the sentence graph, then you need the word with in there. And Absolutely. then a lot of times what happens is, like in sentiment analysis, you have the word not or without and those types of things. And so people are specifically wanting to make sure that there's not a feature in one of the results. And a lot of times, naive search will specifically find those those matching ones happens all the time. Even on Amazon, it happens. Oh yeah, totally. it's, this is a it's a debate within the the Lucene community at the moment. It's you know, the standard analyzer, the, the thing you use out of the box, comes with English stop words included. Yeah, and it's like, well, first of all, we shouldn't be defaulting to English language stuff because you know Lucene's used all over the world. Why are we? Yeah, why do we have a language specific thing in there? And secondly, it's 2016. Why do, why do we have stop words? Yeah, it's like, oh, you're taking up extra space on, on this. It's like, go. Here's twenty dollars. Go buy the disc. <laughs> why, why do we care about this? Most people, thing? most people get in trouble with stop words more than I see it helping. Yeah. Because they don't use the same analyzer for the query as they did for the index. Oh no, I got to do it. Phrase, phrase, phrase queries. So uh, if you, what, yeah, yeah, if you search for with, like I don't know, shopping with Doug is a phrase. It's and I had a client that was doing uh, actually analyzing Twitter, and just use a standard analyzer. And Twitter has a ton of like stop wordy kind of things that get taken out. And they actually really matter because you're searching like you're doing a lot of phrase searches over. Okay. Yeah, so shopping with Doug would pretend you, you do that to query and you get back shopping without Doug as a result because it's also the classic one is uh, you can't search for to be or not to be. Yeah. Right? And that phrase is entirely stop words. Or it might be an operator, depending on your professor. Well, yeah, yeah that's too yeah. easy entirely, yeah. Or, and so can not. And, yes. Stop a, class, not a, a classic one with, that we ran into was um, beds without headboards. Never mind whether or not headboards is one word or two, but head, but beds without headboards. The, the documents that are beds that don't have headboards do not mention headboards. So what you really want to do is take up the word without and take up the word headboards, <laughs> technically. But it's or the it's going to give you the the headboards coming up. Right. Or some of the, right. of the yeah. documents will say headboard colon no. <laughs> <laughs> That's so hard. you don't have that. You really have to here. analyze that <laughs> and say, yeah. well, check, don't check the headboard box. In a sense. Right. But a lot of times you don't go to that level of detail. Right. Right. Yeah, in a legal in a legal context, there's a lot of arguments about stuff as well. Yeah, yeah. So you do pattern search. You need to. You want to have an exact phrase there. You want to make sure. Yeah, you exactly. With. with yeah. Um, I'm new to Elasticsearch, so this one. That's a question, but um, from my understanding, you might not want to use Elasticsearch kind of. To store long-term data in it, right? Um, How do you feel about that? I, I don't. Yeah. I don't feel great about it. All right. So my my, my question <laughs> is, my question is, like, like I could people. I mean, people do it. Yeah. It depends. I wouldn't. I would not use Elasticsearch to be like my system of truth for like things that are important. It's it, it. A lot of times, the best case scenario in a traditional search context is you have your system of truth. And if you need to, you can throw away the search engine and re-index it pretty quickly. Or re-index it to the other system and throw away the, uh, uh, throw away the old system or something like that. So, but do you have a specific yeah. 
Please so I, I, I guess my question was, so if you send in data into your Elasticsearch and something like MySQL, and um, is, is there a way to integrate Elasticsearch to say, well, I wasn't able to find it inside my indexes, so put the query into MySQL, or is that just through your... I wasn't of, able to find it, like, in Elasticsearch, so, like, trigger this... Yeah. This indexing process? Yeah, is, would that be done more in your language, or is that I think that's say, done more in your language, yeah. Okay. That's okay. So. Okay. E even if you could do that in Elasticsearch, I'm not sure okay. if you want to, because it'd be, like, this other weird workload. There is, like, I mean, for a long... And that's, they, like, for a long time, Elasticsearch had, like, rivers, which did all this data munging to bring stuff from SQL into Elasticsearch. Yeah. That's been deprecated. Uh, is it completely, Igor, is our rivers it's completely gone? gone. gone. Igor is completely gone, and uh, I think Elasticsearch is not the right place to put this functionality. It yeah. should be, it should definitely live outside of Elasticsearch. Right. Yeah, it's, it's a, and the reason you want to do that is if you think about a database or yeah. a search engine similar. If you're doing a lot the more you can reduce the kinds of workloads that it's responsible for, the better off you're going to be, because you're going to be doing things like caching and all kinds of stuff. Yep. And all of a sudden, it has to run the SQL query and like churn over lots of data yeah. or like that. It's then you're going nuts. And yeah. At the beginning of the presentation, you you talk about like time, what time, how long it takes to do. Like a SQL like. So I was word. expecting to see some benchmarks out there. Oh, I would, <laughs> I would expect a search like that to be sub millisecond, like a single term query, especially over that size of data. Uh, and most people like, for larger search indexes that have tons tons more data and have more sophisticated queries, like I tend to shoot for under a hundred milliseconds, um, roughly. So. And, and search is pretty good to keep up with that. Um, SQLite for um, phones uh -huh. uh, has some full text search capabilities and will actually interpret the light query like that. Oh, really? In I didn't know that. Yeah. How do I know that? Because I built a system with <laughs> No, I said I didn't know that. Oh, oh awesome. So, <laughs> yeah, so, so it has, that has some basic indexing capabilities, isn't it? Right, yeah. right. I had no idea. Yeah, it's such things in the world. I know, like, I know that, I know yeah, that, you know, that like Postgres email, had their. It's and, and it's got searches. Yeah. yeah so. Wow. Yeah, I knew Postgres had their uh, like genie indexes. The, there's a famous uh, there's a famous blog article which I don't agree with, but it's basically why do you need a search search index at Postgres? And uh, I mean, I'm sure there it makes sense for some people, but there's a ton. There's like a huge community and breadth of capability within like an elastic search. And you can't shard Postgres. What's that? And Postgres doesn't shard. Yeah, Postgres doesn't yeah. shard. Right. You can <laughs> even put you can even put Lucene indexes inside Oracle, which just sounds horrendous. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I thought or is Oracle text based off Lucene or is uh, I, I thought know. it was something else. I mean it's, that there's a deck just Oracle products. That's right? true, yeah it's presumably it's a deck of but it's, 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 it's closed source, so we don't know. Yeah, last time I looked at Oracle, Oracle Text was their main search. Yeah, it's like search. A, it, it, they bought in Decker, Decker, and, yeah, I know that. and then um, would mysteriously got considerably more expensive. <laughs> so I that's wonder why. I'm moving away from that. The sales there. guys will take you to more golf places and whatnot. No, they'll, they'll take your manager to more golf places. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you, the devs don't get taken to golf. <laughs> I do know at one point they were hiring solar people. Don't know what for. <laughs> Maybe Indeka is completely in solar now. <laughs> <laughs> I think Amazon uses solar. Yeah. Yeah. For cloud search, they, yeah. they had A9 and then they moved away from it towards solar. Yeah, yeah I was Thomas I was talking to earlier. It's yeah. Was the A9 guy is now that works at AWS. Oh really? Yeah. It's on cloud search. Yeah. Oh okay. Yeah, so they would, so they have cloud search, which is solar, and they also have an OSF cloud. Yeah, it's so funny because they will never say it, but they'll be at at the conference being like, "Oh, cool." Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Any other questions? Uh, another one. 
Uh, it, it's all good when you when we talk about index in uh, single documents. But what about uh, collections of documents? What kind of documents? Uh, collections of documents. Collection of documents. Batch. Well, indexing in batch. Or... Uh, no, I'm not saying. Uh, talking about indexing in batch, I'm talking about related documents like aircraft repair records, for example. Okay. Where there's a hierarchical relationship yes. or, or yes. parent child. Yeah, so uh, there are ways of doing parent-child relationships in Elasticsearch. Um, there's, uh, all, there's a bunch of different ways. So there's like pretend parent-child documents, which are sort of like nested fields within, basically pretending like we have, uh, a mul there's something called multi-value fields. Are you familiar with that? Basically like if I have three cast members in my movie, and they all have names, I'm just going to have a name field with uh, William Shatner, and then we're going to kind of like I'm hitting, holding the space bar down. Patrick Stewart, and then I'm going to hold the space bar down, just far, far enough away. And then ultimately you get to, you know, your third cast member, uh, Leonard Nimoy or something. So that's one way of doing it. Um, and then there's ways of modeling actual parent-child documents. There's parent-child documents, which are basically documents that coexist on... A, the same shard and get joined back at uh, when they're brought back for their specific queries for doing parent child uh, relationships. Uh, I think there's also something, there's nested documents too, which I think are another thing entirely. No, it's a nested document, it's like another, it, it's, it's one document, and then you have kind of like a fake, say, okay, well, we're having these fields, which are pretending Is that the multi value are, field thing? It's kind of, it's, yeah. Yeah, I don't think you can, but it's not something that the ego It's, no it's one document, you index it as one document from Elasticsearch perspective. Yeah. But internally, inside Elasticsearch, on the same level, it's actually getting indexed as one parent document and a whole bunch of small documents. Okay. And using yeah, special so. query, you can find these small documents, like yeah. nested documents, and from them, figure out what their parent document was and get back the parent document. So it's it's somewhat similar to parent child, mm -hmm. but with parent child you can index parents separately and children separately. Okay, that's the difference. Yeah. Like they, they can be like you, you, you can index parent today and you can index their children like a year from now and this is probably fine. With nested documents, they have to be part of the same document. If you if something changes you have to reindex them directly. But they're much faster because this relationship they, they are Allocated to uh, the same place on the in the index, and it's very easy to find parent from the child. So with parent child, we have to build this relationship, and we have to kind of traverse it. Uh, so it's it's a little, it, it's long, but so, you have flexibility of indexing them. Uh, I think the multi-value field thing is just called inner objects, right? Where it just maps. Yeah, there's the inner objects. Will be inner object. Yeah, and that just maps the sub-documents to multi-value fields that just have almost like parallel arrays of the same thing in one Lucene document. And then, yeah, what Igor said about nested and parent child documents. Yeah, so on a related note, I don't know if there's any equivalent of this in Elasticsearch, but in Solar, there's a, a graph search capability that's not actually in 621 yet, I don't think, but it's available as a, a patch that, that's been lying around for a year or two. Yeah. Is this the uh, graph? This is Kevin, Kevin Waters. Kevin Waters. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 What's his last name? I forgot. Waters. Waters. Kevin Waters. Yeah. 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 Waters, is right. It, is it not in a release? It's definitely in Master. Oh. I think it's oh, a 621, isn't it? Oh, okay. News to me. Sure. Cool. Yeah. So there's a, and that graph is like actually modeling a graph, like to look at the like security permissions and stuff. Right. And also that the idea of it is that you have documents just flatly documents, but then find a reference to a document. You can have a, a, a field that references right. another document right. and then have the search go a certain number of uh, server-side queries on this. So yeah, it queries just... and then traverses the graph by querying again and then querying again and so forth as far down as you want. And then, and then so if you had, it, that's like, to put that in context, you can actually use that and it works pretty well. But it's like, if I have a a document, and I might have an access list that is another document of who can 
actually view this. And maybe I get this document and I say, see, you know, pull back the access list as well, and that's in some other document. Can you do stuff like see if this matches, see if Doug Turnbull matches in this access list? I saw a demo that Kevin did that was amazing where he did <laughs> uh, a graph of um, animals using animals as the yeah. model of a taxonomy, but he, he said, uh, basically did a miniature IBM Watson on his laptop where he said, like, is a cat a jaguar? And it said no, because it returned no nodes as it traversed through. It traversed like an and ontology. And vice versa, it is a jaguar a cat? And it said yes. Cool. But but it, it had to do, like, n number of queries on the server side. And you can, you can do it in such a way where you're just like, go up, like, it's not limited to 10. Just keep going until you reach the edges of the graph. Obviously, you don't want to do that if you have millions of nodes, but like with Common. 100 nodes, it's not going to take very long. Yeah. <laughs> but then, so Elasticsearch 5 has got, doesn't, isn't there a graph yeah. API in that? Yeah. That's a yeah, different so that's, thing. It's, it's yeah. slightly different. Right, okay. So, what, graph, yeah, what the graph API does, it's based more on discovering relationships as opposed to modeling relationships. Like, So, you would do like near duplicate matching and stuff like that? Yeah, you would do, well, you would do things like, uh, finding out uncommonly common stuff. Yeah, uncommonly common stuff. It's, uh, I actually have a demo. <laughs> <laughs> if you're curious, is any people curious about this? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so a great use case for this, something we've been we've been working on is actually recommendation systems. So what I've indexed in this can't you see it? Demo, I'm actually this demo's I'm actually building the documents I have in this index are users and the movies they like. This is based on the movie lens data set, which is a common open uh, data set of movie preferences. So I'm just basically building these documents that are just like that's liked movies and a bunch of movie IDs. Here's Bob. Blah blah blah. And I'm putting in all I'm putting in these documents all the movies a user has rated or so movies people generally like. And what you can do with this using graph and there's a, a blog article that digs into the technical details of this. <coughs> but basically what you do with graph is you issue basically a C query. And you say, okay, I like I like these movies. Someone give me a movie that they like. Good Will Hunting. What's that? Good Will Hunting. Good Will Hunting. Oh, there you go. Good Will Another one. It's like kind of somewhat artificial. It's like a group generating or anything. All right, so they can. 
one of his Pirates of the Caribbean. That might not be the first one, but that one. So, what you need to think about when you do recommendations in with this data model I set up is our, your goal is to take the movies you like, search across other users, find users that are most similar to you. This is user to user recommendations. And then see what's uncommonly common in that data set, basically, what's statistically significant. So if I'm a, if I say I like a whole bunch of Star Trek, and I look, the general population of moviegoers like Star, Star Wars maybe 1%. If I look at people like me who are Star Trek nerds, all of a sudden 25% of people like Star Wars. That jump is really significant. Um, and if we see what we get here, interestingly, we get generates Transformers and Harry Potter. Apparently, are and other Pirates of the Caribbean, other superhero movies. Well, where are we? Google Hunting. Sherlock Holmes maybe comes a little bit. Maybe Sherlock Holmes is the intersection of Google Hunting and Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> Seems about right. And we're looking over. We have some controls here, so we're looking over a thousand users. We want to see the thousand most similar users. We don't want to look at every user that's similar to us because there's people that are just trailing off that might just match one movie. We're looking at just a thousand similar users. And we can control, this is basically just min should match, if you know what that is. It's just controlling how many of the movies I like should match in a candidate user. So, Elastic Search, this is just basically using the graph API. I can say I want to look at 50 similar users. So really, really close to me. I'm going to make that zero. It might not do anything. And all of a sudden, I guess, hey, that's actually, uh, what's his name? Just to start. Johnny Depp. Yeah. Green Lantern, others, some more stuff. So interesting. Um, this one seems like kind of an outlier. Not sure what that's about. Uh, Narnia kind of makes sense. So it seems about right. Um, how how are your users determined? For example, if you have let's just say two users, one that have seen has seen two movies, Pirates of the Caribbean and Green Lantern, the other yeah. one has seen a hundred movies. Yeah. So how are these likes determined? I guess. And two, would it always have this? Like when you say fifty users, is it kind of 50 from the latest users, the oldest users. So right now, it's all the users in the movie lens, the largest movie lens data set. I know, but is it just kind of from the top, from the bottom? Like, where does that base start? So like, uh, it's basically the users that are, so you can think of it as a search query. Yeah. If I search for uh, restaurants for taco and burrito, I'm going to get a bunch of Mexican restaurants. Yeah. In this case, I'm searching users okay. for Goodwill Hunting and Pirates of the Caribbean, and I'm getting, I'm looking at 50 that are really relevant to that. Yep. Uh, the people who are just like me, and happen to like Goodwill Hunting and Pirates of the Caribbean. Um, and we're looking at that, the top 50 of that data set, and we're yep. saying, what really pops here? Okay. Um, and the cool thing is that that query, you have the entire power of the Elasticsearch query DSL to define that, what yep. relevant means for you. Maybe you skew it by people who have actually been on the site in the past year. Mm. Uh, maybe you incorporate other things and like uh, demographics, for example, direct demographics. Um, and then you could also incorporate things like movies that specific users like. The, the, those the aspects of the movies that users like. So, yep. what's a predominant genre? What's a predominant age release date of a movie? Uh, more like the. How many people know what more like this is? More like this is basically a way of just saying, um, let me look at all the text in this movie and do issue a search query against. I look at all the text in all the movies that I like, and I look at all the text in all the movies you like, and I can extract those and actually issue a search based on what terms seem to be most important. Maybe it's Johnny Depp, yeah. maybe it's Pirates, and I can use that. And actually that causes our friend Johnny Depp to come back to the top. 
Um, it kind of reshuffles things. So you can play with it, yeah. Yeah, how would, I'm just curious, how would you model fatigue in this system? Let's say I'm back watching action movies back to back. So I mean, after a certain point of time, I would want to watch some other thing and not action, right? Oh, that's a good question. How would you model fatigue? So I would probably, with these kinds of systems, I think it's always good to have some serendipity into them. Um, so some amount of randomness uh, uh, about what kinds of things are coming back. So you could change. You could probably incorporate that into your search query too. So you might be able to maybe do interesting if we could construct a query that was like a mixture of relevant and a few sort of irrelevant random things in there as well. That might be interesting. I'd have to think about that. So there would be no searches. No two searches are ever like that. Possibly, yeah. So this is a recommendation system. So how did you know that? I mean, how do you know that the user is, is getting good recommendations? That's a really good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so how do we know any recommendation or search user is getting good stuff? Is probably the hardest problem I work on all the time. And a lot of it has to do with understanding your domain and understanding what analytics means in your domain. So um, people click on a movie, they watch it for five minutes, they go away, they don't like it maybe. Uh, and a lot of it actually has to do with using usability testing to understand how to interpret your analytics, because people immediately go to click analytics and think that's the right answer. But there's a lot of sort of context that has to, yeah. Yeah, Right, yeah, you, yeah, you can track analytics about how people are searching and I think allowing thing, users but, to browse off profile too yeah. can help a lot, right? I, I often think of recommendations almost like channel surfing. Right. Like I don't to some extent people have been so focused on rec being having hundred percent accurate relevant recommendations. I wish that they would just make it easier for me to swipe and see the next stuff. Mm. Like because I just want to quickly browse stuff and uh, uh, a lot of times recommendations have a pretty, pretty like low value to me. It's just kind of it's as opposed to search, where ironically people for some reason don't focus as much on relevance. But search is actually really important to be relevant because it's your uh, people are actually asking you a question and they expect you to under understand what you're saying. And then the last thing on here is, it's, this is graph, so we can reach n levels, keep reaching n levels deep, and we can scope that exploration with Elastic Graph, and for some reason, the tourist, of, I guess, was not a particularly liked movie by many people, <laughs> so there's not much there. But if we look at, we can scope this exploration to users like me, so we can say, users like me, Transformers, apparently I'm in this, Super the thing. Pirates of the Caribbean battleship, and if I get rid of that and just look globally, does it change anything? It kind of does, yeah. I am number five. What is that? I am number four. <laughs> Wrath of the Titans. Scooby Doo, apparently. <laughs> what everyone else likes, and the hangover for Pirates of the Caribbean. But people like me, battleship. Maybe because it's, oh, because it's like ocean stuff. I don't know. <laughs> so, would it be possible to actually kind of turn the debug on and see the logic behind because I, I can, what might make sense is I have a blog article on how I did this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to read it to you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I posted this on the, on the meetup page and I walked through, there's a uh, graph API. Elastic graph, if you're not, we don't want Facebook. Is it? No, that's a, there's a RESTful API for graph. And you can actually play with this in Kibana too, so you can see these kind of relationships. Um, so there's this documentation here for how to issue these queries to the graph plugin. And graph is a product, by the way, it's not, it's not off. So you, you can you get it for free for 30 days or something. 
Um, and I walk through how to construct a graph query uh, to do what I was doing. And this whole thing is open source. So you can come over here and someone needs to give me a star. <laughs> yes, sir. So, other fun things you can insert. And it will be interesting with us, you can also take this kind of uncommonly common stuff, understand what's important to you, and then you can get into search personalization, which is the bridge between search and recommendations. So, awesome stuff. So, something to add some of our, uh, some folks that have used Graph are using web log data. And they're searching for admin and seeing attack vectors of who's coming yeah. in and be able to get the IP address and the connection between where they're hitting on your, on your website. And that's a way of validating the value if you can trace it back and search. It's really powerful. Like, Elasticsearch in general is a really powerful technology for finding these <coughs> things. Like, who is, what is, uh, what is different this today versus yesterday? <coughs> these things are uncommonly common. All of a sudden, this is happening. Okay, we focus on those. What is special about that? Oh, it's the <coughs> computers. And it's, you know, you keep having, it's, it's a great way of finding these sorts of insights about a broad set of disciplines. I think we have like <coughs> three minutes left, and I need to give people books. And you can see all of these. I think. There was one more back there, by the way. Thank you. And don't. If you're a terrible person, I didn't give you the book. <laughs> There's a use the rel search discount code, but I'm sure. And I'm all set. Okay. Would you recommend writing a book? Thank you. <laughs> hey, what's he smoking on the, on the cover? That's what I want. <laughs> Interesting story about this man. He is the man of Patmos. Patmos is the oh, island. Yeah. Well, the book of Revelation. So, end of the world. <laughs> so, no, you wouldn't recommend writing. One more. And come find me and I'll sign it for you. Yeah, you should go. Ooh, I got one right here. Thanks. Uh, good job. Thank you.